Dr. William Rosenberg is joining us. Dr. William Rosenberg is professor of political science at Drexel University, co-author of News Verdicts, The Debates and Presidential Campaigns. He is tweeting at DRB Rosenberg. Bill, welcome. Thanks for being here today. Good morning. Feels like the world has totally changed since the last time we spoke. Absolutely. Two weeks ago when we spoke the day before the uh, South South Carolina primary, we were looking at a situation where we had more candidates in the race, and it looked like Joe Biden was sort of on his uh, last legs with little money, little organization beyond South Carolina. And with the, um, with the outcome, with a major endorsement by Clyburn just before, and then with the endorsements of some of his former rivals, it seems like everything has turned around. Let's talk about endorsements, because as you mentioned with Jim Clyburn, on the Monday before the South Carolina primary, he endorsed Joe Biden and said it was actually he had done it on that Wednesday when the, the primary was on a Saturday. So it was a few days where it had a chance to take effect. But a lot of people were looking to Jim Clyburn uh, in terms of what he was going to say and how he was going to vote. And he made this impassioned plea, Joe Biden, um, we know Joe, but he knows us, which is which was really effective. One wonders after that, Bill, how much do endorsements really matter. Kamala Harris coming out for Joe Biden, uh, Judge Jesse Jackson coming out for Bernie Sanders. What what do endorsements really mean? Well, I think traditionally we viewed endorsements as an influencer, but not as dramatic, I don't think, as what we saw with, with uh, Jim Clyburn. Jim Clyburn had a unique relationship with not only Joe Biden, but with also the people of South Carolina. Um, Joe Biden had staked his campaign basically on the firewall that South Carolina was going to provide him. And if he did not do well, uh, his campaign was was going to basically be over. Uh, You know, he put all his cards on the table and essentially uh, he he won. And not only did he win, but he won very big. If Biden had squeaked out just a small victory, then it would have been the game of expectations. People would have said, sure, he won, but he was expected to win in South Carolina. But now let's turn our our direction towards Super Tuesday. If we look at it historically, what we have seen over the last, um, I don't know, 40 years or so is the is the coming of age of, of that whole concept of Super Tuesday when uh, a number of states now, about 14, um, are weighing in on who the nomination is going to go to. It was really designed to, in some ways, help moderate candidates who are sort of more well-known and who had big, bigger organizations develop a, a knockout punch. Uh, in many ways, though, that hasn't happened over the years, and as a result, um, they have to continue the battle a little bit longer uh, but at the same time, I think what's happened is the whole electoral race in, in 2020 got turned on its head because of South Carolina happening in such a dramatic way. Just before Super Tuesday, it allowed uh, Joe Biden then to basically sweep 10 of 14 states. Now, when I say 10 of 14 states, it wasn't that he won by the same majority as he did in mm-hmm. South Carolina, but the way you count it. Uh, ultimately, as in delegates, he was able to reverse the field, uh, like in soccer, and uh, basically took the lead. And now it's Sanders' um, sort of need to try and catch up and stay in the race. I'm, I'm glad you brought up history because it reminds me that as these rules are drawn up and they're trying to avoid having a brokered convention, even though we in the media would love to have something like that, the Democrats and Republicans don't want that either. And yet the rules that they come up with often for these contests are rules that are designed to handle the politics of the day. If you were to go back to Ronald Reagan, who actually carried California twice because he was a former governor. But it seems to me that these rules, you put them in place, but they're not necessarily going to apply for the circumstances of a particular year. In the case of Joe Biden, for example, his ability to win in South Carolina, I think, was unique to the Democratic candidates. And I don't know that a rule that would be in place would apply to future contests. And so when parties try to take the heavy hand here, it seems they run into a lot of difficulty trying to outthink the voting public. Well, I think we have to be careful about how we view this whole concept of rulemaking. Probably uh, the example that I would use would be going back to George McGovern. George McGovern was involved in what was called the mcgovern Fraser Report uh, at the uh, tail end of the 70s going into uh, at tail end of the 60s going into the 70s as a response to sort of democratize the Democratic uh, 
electoral process within the party. And while it was successful in getting him to win, it did not produce a winner that was going to be able to compete in the in the general election, and he got trounced. Uh, a num- number of other people have been able to win the nomination, but the, there's a difference between winning the nomination and winning the general election. So while it's sort of desirable to have let's say, more women, more minorities, more young people as delegates to have greater participation, to have a more transparent process. There's also the question about who the party needs to choose to be able to carry the day. And that's why we have this whole issue about not just about the desirability of a candidate, but also the electability of them. Uh, one of the backdrops of this is also the issue about the superdelegates. If you go back and you look, the superdelegates used to have a greater role. These are uh, top elected officials, senators, governors, big party people, big city mayors, and choosing the election. And, and in fact, uh, going back to the 1800s and early 1900s, they were the people who chose. And as we used primary elections to open up the process and allow the people to vote, um, the parties have lost control in many ways and, and, and opened the door for special interest groups and now PACs and super PACs. So we have to really balance sort of what our goals are in terms of choosing the candidate and making sure that the candidate that gets chosen to represent a party actually represents the party and has electability. Well, it reminds me of uh, when you said the, the the elected officials, for example, these are the people who actually are very, very much um, a part of the party. These are not like, you know, some elected smoke room, back room smoking guys that are that are trying to decide these things. I was just thinking about the 60s, the establishment, man. And it's it, the echoes uh, are ringing so much today. Um, I, I wonder as we get ready for the primaries tomorrow, uh, you have noted that Michigan is an important one to watch because Bernie Sanders did win that in 2016, and that's one of those blue-collar type states. Uh, with the election, though, with all of the rallies and everything that are taking place, coronavirus has become a concern. The parties are saying they're looking at it. Senator Sanders saying yesterday, well, you know, we're trying to take best advice and guidance from any health officials. President Trump says they're going to continue. Are there other ways that this can affect uh, the presidential campaign, at least the primary campaign right now? Well, um, a couple of issues. Um, One is I think absolutely the uh, coronavirus can influence the process. I mean, I I, I know this sounds kind of um, a little futuristic and a little bit outlandish, but, you know, there is the possibility if this uh, situation continues to get worse and worse, there's going to be the issue about what's going to happen with the remaining primaries. You know, do you really want to have a lot of people standing in long lines and cramped conditions to go able to vote? Um, so then the question would be what alternative processes could be put into place and how receptive are different audiences within the public to comply with those responses or just stay home? You also have the issue about whether the conventions can take place. You know, we always see these photographs and, and video of this massive throng of people in a convention center all waving signs and mingling with each other. Is that really going to be such a, a great possibility if, if uh, the virus is, is raging in some way at that point in time? We have to hope that, that this is going to pass, it's going to end soon, and that the health status of the public is going to begin to return back to normal. But, you know, it's kind of an open question. There's also the question about leadership and how the leader is going to be able to respond. Um, You know, we end up seeing, for example, Joe Biden uh, sort of talking about his experiences as being a national leader dealing with major viruses or major epidemics, both domestically and worldwide. Sanders doesn't really have that experience, so it's a little bit of a handicap for him. Uh, But on the other side of the coin, both of them can rally against Donald Trump, who was a a little bit of the boy who was crying wolf in the beginning, saying this is not really so serious, we don't really have to do much, that we're well prepared, even though he removed the person in his uh, sort of uh, national um, security agency that was charged with dealing with them. His budget was going to reduce funds for uh, the CDC and NIH. So it becomes a political sort of uh, issue that the Democrats combined, whether they're Bernie Sanders or Joe Biden, might use against President Trump. We'll see how it all turns out. We'll continue to uh, see how things are in two weeks if the world has changed again. Dr. Bill Rosenberg. Bill, thanks so much. You take care. Have a good day.
Dr. William Rosenberg, professor of political science at Drexel University. Thoughts on the state of the race 2020 and some of the other issues surrounding it, tweeting at Dr. or at Dr. B. Rosenberg, R-O-S-E-N-B-E-R-G.